So on Wednesday, well, okay, let's back it up to Tuesday. On Tuesday, I was going through the bottles that I had of my second batch of grape wine. And I put several into fifth bottles that were originally containers of Irish cream. And I was pretty sure that they had been cleaned out thoroughly. Everything uh, rinsed through, clear. But then I found a ring in one of the bottles before I uh, filled it, after the other ones had already had some in them. So I, uh, I went Tuesday night knowing I was going to distribute these out to people on Wednesday. And just tested out a little splash off the top of each bottle, make sure there was no stuff floating in it, make sure everything was consistent. And around this time realized that one of the fifth bottles I had was um, this uh, clear glass. The original wine it contained was a mix of duck, Dutch cocoa and red wine and cream. It was basically a chocolate milk red wine. It was really good. Um, but the cheap stamped metal like little foil cap on it um would not tighten in any significant way it just it, it had broken loose from over twisting so i went to walmart and purchased uh wine stoppers and i had a stopper in this bottle and the pressure because apparently it was still fermenting the pressure had built up inside the bottle and popped the stopper and in the hours that I was gone, there was apparently a fruit fly that had made its way inside the cupboard and into this wine. And I tested it. It was immediately off. It's not that it wasn't drinkable, but this fly had been marinating in my fancy fucking wine for hours. And it ruined the flavor of the wine. So I had to pour that fifth out. I also noticed that the uh, 1.5 liter gallo bottle that I had of... Uh, the remaining watermelon wine that seemed to be okay also had like 10 fruit flies floating in it. So I had to pour that out. So now I have an extra gallo bottle. So Wednesday, I distributed the uh, remaining bottles to people that I promised them to. And then took the last bottle of the fifths. I still have uh, one of them that's a 1.5 or 2 liter that's full. And another that's a 1.5 gallo that's like half full now because I broke some off for someone and I got somebody else wanting some off of that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's gone pretty well. Uh, the, the flavor profile on that second batch was really phenomenal. Um, the bouquet and the, the palette really just go through phases and, and it was pretty consistent. Um, you, uh, break it open and you let it sit and air out. And once it's aired out, you give it a good whiff. And you get the scent of like a brand new leather jacket like that. It's, it's, it's hard to explain. It's a savory smell, but it reminds of leather. And over time, you move through uh, some fruit varieties and celery, green peppers. Move on through uh, butter and honey at the end. And it's interesting because the butter honey smell is very reminiscent, I now realize, to the um, the leaves on the vines when, like, I went out and picked some more here, which I'll get to, and the smell of these fall leaves was very, very similar to the smell at the end of a glass of this wine. So Wednesday, I took the last bottle with me to Pekin because I was going to see 311 at the Peoria Civic Center. That was a great show. I have video of it. I just haven't uploaded. Um, they've got professional quality videos that are up of that show, and I'll probably get copywritten or something. But really, I just wanted to record some songs that uh, I would want to remember and a few that were my sister's favorites, too, that she might like to see. Um I gave the last bottle that I had to uh, my best friend since third grade for him and his wife to split. <clears throat> and by the end of the, the evening there was 
successful in conveying that, like, this is not just some bullshit prison wine that I made in my room. Like, this is top shelf stuff that I just accidentally made and I'm giving away. So, you know, keep it cold, enjoy it. There's a whole process. Don't just gluck it down. And then I've got people that I've given some to that they're just like, I just want to drink the shit out of that. It's like, please don't do that. You're wasting it if you do. Like, you know, you need to do it right. You need to sit down with this and smell it. Enjoy the, the way all the way through. And uh, just a guy wanted to try a little dibble sip and he did. And it was like, give it a second. And he just goes, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, you dumb fucker. So, yesterday... In the AM, headed to work to be there at 11. I was running a little bit behind and just walking up toward my car, kind of glanced up and happened to notice a number of ripe bunches of grapes. And was like, well, shit, coming back to that later today. So then I got off of work about 6.30, 6.45. Uh, got home just in time for the sun to start going down and the rain to start falling, but that did not stop me. Um, got my Vulcan ladder out with the adjustable length uh, legs and ended up getting the ladder to work in some fairly precarious positions that were nonetheless somewhat stable and was able to get up and get a whole bunch of well accessible just overlooked bunches of grapes a lot a lot of noble rot on these compared to the last ones and got as far as I could I ended up like standing on the old camper trailer uh I don't know that I got the ladder up there. At, in, I did that today, but not last night. But anyways, yeah. So I went through about an hour last night, hour and a half. Uh, and finally, it was just a little bit too much rain. I got everything that was really within reach safely to do. And I was like, anything else I'll get tomorrow. I'll get the pole saw out and the sunlight. So I woke up today, uh, having stored those grapes. I got about this far into the bottom of the five-gallon bucket from last night. And so I went out. And after waking up, drinking a bunch of coffee, kind of, you know, ran out of anything else to do. It was like, all right, I guess I'm going to get dressed to go out and keep on them grapes. So I went out and found some uh, small bunches uh, in places that I thought I'd gotten that I'd missed some. So I got those down and I found a few more that were kind of an obvious eye level stuff, but were just hidden beneath, you know, leaves from the vine. You can see my fingertips. <laughs> and so I uh, went so far today as to locate all of them on the area by the truck at the driveway, get them all down. There was some uh, treetop clipping I did of some mulberries that uh, brought some vines lower, and then I clipped some of these vine runners so that... Uh, uh, the whole segments with the bunches would come down. And my hope is that next year, these ends of the vine will sprout, branch off, and, and have uh, runners with bunches of grapes on them that will develop after, like having been lowered, that maybe next year after the harvest of the grapes, I might actually have these things close enough to the ground that I can trim out some of these volunteer trees and maybe put up something that'll work as a, a vineyard post or something or some way to make a, a grape arbor more feasible because the grapes that I harvested today were between 20 and 30 feet off the ground and my ladder only goes up so high and so I had to get a, uh, I think it's about a 15, 16 foot pole saw with a rope pole lopper and was able to get a ladder up onto the barn foundation wall and standing up on that, leaning on a mulberry tree, was able to get a lot of stuff clipped to where I then got down onto the ground with this pole saw and was able to basically skewer these shrubbery bits that had all the grapes and everything in it. I didn't want to try and yank them through and knock grape bunches off and lose grapes and everything. And I did manage to, without much in the way of loss, get maneuver these segments of foliage down and separate the tree branches out and get the grapes. Ultimately got to about this far from this far in the bucket. And then as I was going to take them inside and uh, kind of set them with the lid and wait and see what else I might find or, you know, after work, I wouldn't have time to do the, the processing or anything before. And I thought to myself, well, I should go take a look around the edge of the yard on the other side of the yard over the other way, 
because I, I'm thinking there's grapevines over there too. And lo and behold, I find a this ancient gnarled mulberry tree that's growing. Technically, the trunk is on the neighbor's property to the south. And this huge arbor reaches over and comes down almost to the ground. And all over the top of this, at this huge, I mean, there's a limb this big around that is like 30 foot that is just reaching like an, an arc. And the grapevines have grown up from the other land onto this over on this this mulberry tree. And they were all within about a six foot radius or less because I didn't have to move the ladder. Once I had the ladder set up for the spot, I was able to reach all of the grapes. So I got them in, made it to about this deep in the bucket. So having successfully harvested every grape on my property and a few reaching over onto my property from elsewhere, uh, was it no more grape bunches. There are a couple that were hanging out underneath of a bird nest at the Mulberry Arbor that the uh, grapes underneath had a little fuzz on them that didn't look the same. And I was like, that's hanging out underneath of a bird nest. I'm not, that, who knows what kind of weird toilet's going on there. So I left those. Um, but these other ones were really ripe. And there was a lot of them that were also starting to raise and also starting to have the noble rot. So there's like a third of these grapes were noble rot. And uh, I, unlike the last time, included all the crunchy ones, all the little hard little gravel looking ones, um, all the little immature ones, some of which had also had that on it, and uh, took them all in bunches, as close cropped to the bunch as possible in this bucket, took it to work, and then froze them. Because I've been hearing about a technique called ice wine, where you freeze the grapes before you debunch them. And I'll tell you, it was a lot easier. It was a hell of a lot easier with the grapes being frozen, except for the part where you have to be in the freezing environment while doing it. So I went into the work freezer after I got all my other work done and had a little free time waiting on the end to ship to start plucking them out. And I had to stop because my hands were too cold. And I was like, oh, I should grab a jacket. So I had a couple of hoodies in my car that I grabbed and took them in and wore them and... Hands are still freezing, little bits of grape juice here and there still coming off, and just freezing my fingertips. So then I took them out into the the main you know kitchen area, uh, the you know food prep area and whatever, and started plucking them out a little more rapidly that way until they started softening because of the temperature. And then by then it was the end of shift, and I had to go uh, do my paperwork and you know check out all my money. So I put the grapes back in the freezer and. Went and did that, and when that was done, got all my tasks done, got off the clock, and then went back in and continued until I was finished. And uh, toward the bottom of it, was able to kind of swish them around inside the, the five-gallon bucket and bang them around and get a lot of these grapes to come off the, the bunches, and it saved me a lot of time. Then I had to go through, though, and pick out like the little leaf bits and some of the, the bunch stems and everything. So I got it down pretty well. And got them all into the bucket. And I want to say that there was about a half gallon, just a little less than a half gallon of, in this, you know, white bucket that I, I've been using, uh, of grapes. And just grapes. So I got that home, uh, got that in the food processor, and pureed the crap out of them in phases. Got it all syrupy and squishy and got it all cleared out of there and... Something like 15 to 20 pounds of sugar have gone into this uh, two and a half gallons of distilled water and grapes. And this is going to be a fine batch. Better water. I used tap water the last time. This time I'm not. Um, and for the uh, yeast start on this batch, I actually took the last half pint of my special reserve from the first batch, which is still fermenting in the jar, right? And a larger quart jar, about a half of that, of the uh, second batch wine that was, uh, or was that, well, it might have been also been the first batch. Anyways, so my special reserve of the first batch was used as the uh, yeast starter for this wine. And initially, uh, you know, it hissed as soon as I opened it. I smelled it, made sure it wasn't just acetic, poured it in, and... Uh, even though the water was cold, there was so much sugar that it was able to start the reaction process. So now it's in this bucket that uh, if you've seen the short video with the OGs, that is the new batch. Uh, the heater in that room is on level two and the thermostat's all the way up and the door is closed. That room's going to be a nice uh, sauna overnight. 
<clears throat> and we'll be getting the uh, the fermentation to kick off with that as well, and I'll be stirring it daily. So uh, today is day one. I'm going to go probably 13, 14 days, maybe longer, depending on what kind of bubbling I get. And uh, this one's a little, I think a little bit stretched from the last one as far as grapes to sugar water. There's more sh more water and sugar than grapes compared to the ratio of the last time. So this wine may not be quite as full-bodied as the second batch, but with any luck, maybe it will because this the juice was thick, dark. Um, nearly opaque anyway. So a couple of weeks here, uh, I've been... At some point, I'll strain out the grapes after that, maybe let it sit and keep going for a while, uh, you know, just to see how much, you know, fermentation it really needs. And then eventually then, of course, uh, I'll end up putting it into uh, some larger bottles. I'm going to have to see about finding some some jugs or bottles or something, uh, empty wine bottles or, or, I don't know, I just, I need dark glass for that. But uh, anyways, this uh, late harvest, Noble Rot, Single Varietal, Marichal Foch, uh, Ice Wine is going to be a banger, I think. It's going to be really strong, uh, a, a proper dessert wine from what I understand. And again, this will be a super full-bodied, uh, very potent, very, very complex from looking at these these little pebble grapes that I got in there and all the different ones that had the, 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 the noble rot and the dried out, they, this is going to be an incredibly complex wine. Um, and this one, I may actually see if I can't figure out some kind of an oak container to store it in for some time before getting it back out because this one may actually need to be mellowed. Um, just the way that the process went, there's some little bits of, uh, um, the bunch stems and there might be a little bit of leaf matter in there and a little bit of the other stemmy twig matter from the the vines that just made its way in can't 100 percent perfectly get everything out especially when the grapes are starting to, to thaw out and the skin that's been broken on them is starting to bleed grape juice and you don't want to waste that so it all went in uh but anyway so that's the update um Two to three weeks from now, I'm going to need to figure out some way to mellow this wine. And if I can do that, find myself a cask or something somewhere that, that can be used. Um, I mean, even with this batch, is not going to be huge. I'm not going to sell it by any means. But uh, come Thanksgiving to Christmas time, for sure, uh, there can be some really, really nice wine to share with people. So... That's what I got. I hope everybody is having a good day. It's been an interesting week for me. And uh, I don't know, man. I'm having fun.